Okay, thank you for the opportunity to um, present this project today, which is actually just starting. Um, it was recently a recipient um, of some funding from the Autism CRC's Utilisation Investment Round. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at UNSW, working also for the CRC, and I'm working on this project with uh, Professor Valsa Epen and Dr. Honey Hoosler from the um, MATA Research. My role in the autism community, uh, I started on the road towards um, research after the diagnosis of my fourth child um, when she was about four years old and she's now 17. Um, and uh, she also experiences uh, significant sleep disturbance, so um, which, um, yeah, it obviously presents its challenges. So I'm really excited to, uh, about this project in hoping that um, we can shed some light on um, some of the behavioural and uh, biological reasons for disturbed sleep. But firstly, I'd like to lay a foundation as to why it's so important to continue to investigate sleep problems in autism by briefly looking at sleep in general. It's good to see that sleep is finally being recognised as a fundamental contributor to health and wellbeing outcomes. However, a good night's sleep is not easily achieved, as sleep is a highly complex state, making it vulnerable to disruption. Sleep arises from the interactions between multiple brain regions, multiple neurotransmitter pathways, and multiple hormones, which all contribute to finely tuned mechanisms. Therefore, the quality of our sleep is exposed to vulnerabilities from multiple potential stresses. This figure shows the impact of chronic sleep disruption and reduced sleep over time. When a person's experiencing sleep disruption, you can see the outcomes resulting from physiological stresses on the right hand side of the figure. These stresses are activated via the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal pathway, also known as the HBA axis. This pathway is involved in a mechanism that drives levels of the hormones cortisol and adrenaline. Not good to have when you're trying to sleep. So that it's these chronically elevated cortisol and adrenaline together drive a widespread stress response, which initiates a number of processes, also detailed on the right-hand side of the figure, and these include a release of glucose into the bloodstream, um, increase in heart rate and blood pressure, suppression of immune responses, uh, slow in digestion, and also reductions in memory consolidation and cognitive function. Subsequent sleep loss and fatigue then drives the psychosocial stresses identified on the left-hand side of the figure. It's these psychosocial stresses are caused by an imbalance between the demands placed on an individual and an inability of the individual to manage these demands as a result of re reduced sleep. So we end up with combined and interlocking effects of physiological and psychosocial stresses leading to emotional, cognitive and physiological pathologies detailed in this table. It's these sorts of pathologies and presentations associated with disturbed sleep that underlie the importance of maximising the likelihood of a good night's sleep. And that's what we're hoping to achieve uh, for children on the autism spectrum through this research. So what does sleep disturbance in children on the spectrum look like? It can manifest as bedtime resistance, difficulties in initiating sleep, which is also known as sleep latency, waking after sleep onset, um, poor sleep maintenance through multiple nighttime arousals, and all of these lead to shortened sleep duration. And um, probably the worst of all after a night's sleep like that is early morning wakenings. So these type of sleep behaviours have been identified in 80% of children on the autism spectrum. And children on the spectrum are twice as likely to have sleep issues as typically developing children or those with other developmental conditions. So children on the spectrum are at high risk for sleep problems. Early sleep problems have been identified as predictor of later repetitive behaviours in childhood 
uh, and also later inattention and hyperactivity. And there's been many studies identifying associations with daytime problem behaviours. And as previously discussed, if children aren't getting enough sleep over time, it may lead to long-term consequences on their health and overall physical well-being. So what to do? First and foremost, um, if a child goes to their sleep paediatrician or GP, they'll suggest um, behavioural strategies to improve sleep, which include establishing bedtime routines, avoiding stimulating foods and drink before bedtime, avoiding video games and TV, which emit the blue light. Now the blue light disrupts your body's natural circadian rhythm. Uh, it reduces the amount of melatonin that's produced because your body thinks it's daylight when it, at daytime when it's exposed to the blue light. Uh, also, a sleep environment will be addressed, including temperature of the room, the sounds and light. And there's been um, some success with parent-based sleep education and also um, children taking melatonin. Um, the melatonin has been helpful in getting children to sleep, but the research is showing that it is not having significant impact on maintaining sleep. So where to start? Whilst behavioural and environmental factors contribute to sleep problems, there may also be genetic basis to people's sleep problems. And an example of a genetic basis is a gene-related alteration in melatonin pathways, which are essential for sleep maintenance. And these may contribute to alterations in circadian rhythms and consequently in sleep regulation. So in our study, we're hoping to identify and differentiate between a behavioural basis for sleep problems or if there might be a biological reason for disturbed sleep. So our research aims are listed here. Um, we're firstly looking to define the difficulties uh, that children on the autism spectrum are um, facing, including sleep latency, waking up to sleep onset and sleep duration. Then um, we're also planning to um, compare these alterations with non-autistic siblings and also control children. Uh, then evaluate the relationship between these sleep difficulties and clinical phenotypes, including gender, autism profiles, cognitive level and sensory profiles, and comorbidities such as um, anxiety, epilepsy and gastrointestinal dysfunction, which is often associated with disturbed sleep. We'll measure melatonin and melatonin metabolites in urine samples and then identify genetic influences that might be contributing to abnormal melatonin metabolism. And then we'll look to evaluate the interactions between sleep and melatonin profiles and phenotypic presentations. So we've, um, we've received approval to access um, phenotype data and biological samples from the Australian Autism Biobank and we've also received ethics approval from UNSW Hatrick. We'll be analysing phenotype data from approximately 1,000 children aged between 2 and 17 and with a diagnosis of autism and 200 non-autistic siblings and approximately 100 typically developing healthy controls. We'll then be performing the biological analyses uh, on a subset of 300 children. So the measures um, that we'll be using, the Childhood Sleep ha Habits Questionnaire, um, I had the pleasure of doing data entry for the Biobank and um, this, uh, the Childhood Sleep Habits Questionnaire was part of a very comprehensive family medical and social history questionnaire. And it was by far the most completed <laughs> part of uh, the battery of all the questionnaires and measures. So clearly sleep is, um, you know, first and foremost on parents' minds. Um, so it's a validated parentally completed questionnaire that's been used to examine sleep behaviour in toddlers, preschool and school age children uh, with a variety of conditions, including autism. Um, the subscales measure um, dimensions such as the bedtime resistance, uh, sleep anxiety, sleep onset delay, sleep duration, and night wakings. Um, we've also um, 
got uh, ADOS on most of the children, a cognitive assessment, either a Mullen or a WISC, depending on their age, a sensory profile and adaptive behaviour using the Vineland 2, and also the um, family questionnaire, um, that, which is very extensive. So the an analysis um, will report descriptive statistics um, on our, all our participant groups, and um, then we'll uh, look at sleep profiles based on the key domains screened in the Childhood Sleep Habits Questionnaire. And they'll be compared to, between autistic children, non-autistic siblings and controls. Um, then within the um, children on the spectrum group, we'll look at um, those that have a sleep problem and those that don't have a sleep problem based on measures of sleep onset delay, sleep duration and total sleep. And then we'll look at um, the correlations between these variables and our um, behavioural attributes and our biological um, measures, including the genetic influences um, contributing to abnormal melatonin metabol uh, metabolism and metabolite concentrations will be examined within the subgroups as well of the children on the autism spectrum. So uh, we look forward um, to um, presenting these results by the Autism CRC, hopefully in um, about October this year. Um, COVID's obviously impacted um, some of it, but we're due to get started on our phenotype dis um, data analysis and profiling in the next month or so. So we're very much looking forward to sharing those results with you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the children on the autism spectrum, their siblings and parents, and other children who generously contributed their time and their data and samples to the Australian Autism Biobank. Bio um, it was, uh, there was a lot of um, requested of families and um, we're most grateful for everything that they've done. And also the various sites who supported um, the recruitment to the Biobank. Okay, there's some uh, references and thank you very much.